good evening from Leapers Fork, Tennessee, from uh, the region of the Church of Grace Chapel. Pastor Steve Berger is right here with me. And we are, I'm going to look into the events of uh, the world over the past week or so, but also give you, uh, in the very beginning, I'll just give you a short update on what happened with uh, the ministry over the past week. I landed in um, Cincinnati exactly a week ago and had a great time on Saturday uh, with uh, Pastor Barry Stagner and Pastor Rick from Calvary Chapel of of Cincinnati. We had a wonderful, wonderful um, prophecy conference in Cincinnati attended by close to 1,000 people. And it was amazing to see people coming from all over the United States and also from Canada. It was wonderful. That was also a chance for me to um, uh, have also my first board meeting with uh, my members, uh, uh, my board members of Behold Israel Canada. We just opened a branch of Behold Israel in Canada and we're going to uh, do more and more activities in Canada under the um, the um, coverage of Behold Israel as registered over there. So these are very, very good news. The, the conference went well. Uh, part of the conference was even broadcasted live on his channel, hischannel.com, Christian TV On Demand. And one of the good things that came out of that is that his channel uh, decided to um, have Behold Israel on their channel regularly. In other words, in about two, three weeks from now, Behold Israel will have its own uh, channel within his channel and where all my messages um, and um, teachings in Israel and uh, around the world will be posted right there. So these are very, very good news. It's an answer for prayer. And the Lord not only provided uh, uh, the means to do that, but also uh, prepare the hearts uh, of the people in charge there to actually suggest that and um, and have us there. So we're extremely, extremely excited and and I'm looking forward to to doing that in the next few weeks. So after, um, as you know, I think I mentioned that after Cincinnati, I made my way to D.C. where it was a wonderful time of fellowship with a lot of people, um, some intercessors, some movers and shakers in, in national policy and in uh, prayer uh, meetings there, and as well as some people in the pro-life movement. I was a, a personal guest of Kathy Ireland, uh, the famous Kathy Ireland, the famous model uh, who is now a very successful businesswoman, but more importantly, a woman of God that supports uh, the right of the unborn and is is, is fighting for that. And uh, I was invited uh, to attend the gala dinner of the Susan B. Anthony um, List, the, the largest organization in the United States for pro-life. And uh, that event was attended for the first time in the history of that organization, was attended not only by close to a thousand people, but the keynote speaker this time was no one else but the President of the United States of America, Mr. Donald Trump, which I admire so much since um, you know uh, not only that he stands for Israel, not only that he stands for Jerusalem, not only that he's a great advocate of the truth um, around the world and he calls, uh, uh, he calls the lie by its name and he calls the truth by its name and he is a man of of great integrity, but I also believe that he had me not when he was for Israel or for Jerusalem, he had me when he was actually for the uh, unborn. When he was the first sitting president that spoke uh, at the March for, of, for Life uh, in Washington, D.C. a few months ago, and now attended that amazing event, to me, it's the most important thing. I believe that if you are standing for the right of the young babies in their mother's womb. And as Psalm 139 says, you know, the Lord has already created us in our mother's womb. He already, He knows every everything about us, every part of us. We are already written in His book. Um, I believe that 
uh, it's about time that we stand up and we fight for one of the most greatest crimes around the world, in Israel, by the way, as well as in America and the rest of the world. We need to make sure that we put an end to that almost, if I may say, genocide of the unborn. And President Trump is a great advocate of this uh, effort to do so. And I, I am so honored uh, not only to have been there in that uh, um, event, but also to know that there is a great effort all across the United States right now to raise more leaders, elected officials, judges, and senators and congressmen to stand for that and maybe even overturn the horrible, horrible Supreme Court decision that uh, had paved the way for the mass murdering of millions of children in the United States of America. So that is uh, what happened. Now, I know that a lot of you asked me if I had the chance to meet with the president personally. Well, I, I was just a few feet away from him. He did look at us when we were, uh, when we were cheering up for, uh, for his remarks regarding Jerusalem. However, the president didn't really come to mingle with people. This time he showed up for the speech and immediately left back to the White House for many more important, I guess, uh, matters to deal with. And so I didn't, unfortunately, had the chance to um, speak to him or, or, or spend time with him. But um, to be where he was and to stand right close to him and to listen to his words uh, live um, and to hear his heart um, was enough for me. Um, and I really, really um, thank the Lord for that opportunity. And I thank, of course, friends that made it possible. During that gala dinner, a short video was shown, and in that short video, we, they featured several people speaking about the rights of the unborn, and I was one of them. I was the only Jewish and Israeli person featured on that video, and uh, so I was honored not only to attend the gala dinner, but also to take part of, of that whole event, and I really hope that um, America will will be on the right path even on that particular issue. I came with a clear message to the United States this, this time and the message is that we live right now in what I call the calm before the storm. In fact that message that I delivered not only in Cincinnati but also a couple nights ago here in Grace Chapel in Leapers Fork, Tennessee, you can find it on YouTube right now. We're almost at 80,000 views in less than two days and if you haven't watched it you need to. We're talking there about um, what is it that is going on right now and how we are truly blessed to have a very limited short time of calm uh, and that is of course to prepare the world, to prepare Israel, to prepare the region for the storm. The Bible speaks in Ezekiel chapter 38 how the attack on Israel will be like a dark cloud, like a storm, the Bible says. So what we are experiencing right now is definitely the calm before the storm. Right now alliances are being built. Right now um, treaties are being signed. Right now um, uh, the hearts of the leaders are being shaped. Right now we see so many things that are happening and, and it leads me, and, and of course one of the things that the president said by the way in D.C. that I believe should speak to all of us is the fact that the victory in 2016 should not cause anyone to uh, uh, rest on and, and his laurels and to think that the battle is already behind us. I believe that the words of 1 Thessalonians 5 are more uh, valid and vivid than ever before when Paul said, Beloved, you are not in darkness so that this, this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of, of the hope of salvation 
For God did not appoint us to the wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that wherever we are, awake or sleep, we should live together with Him. This, of course, speaks loud about on the rapture, awake or sleep. If we're awake, we will be with the Lord. If we're asleep, dead in Christ, we will be taken up to be with Him. And then, of course, the Bible is commending us. Therefore, we need to comfort one another. The Bible says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are un, a, a, unru, unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. But we need to always comfort one another with these world. As the Bible says, He died for us, and that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Even in the previous chapter, when He speaks of the rapture, He says, therefore comfort one another with these words. So, yes, we live in the time of calm. We see Israel has never had it more peaceful than today. I know that many people think that there's a war going on. There. No, Israel is enjoying now a time of peace and prosperity like never ever in its history as a, as a sovereign state in the last 70 years. Are we bracing for the storm? Yes, we are. Do we understand that this calm is temporary? Yes, we do. But the calm right now is for a reason and for a season. And much of it has to do, I believe, for us, the believers, to be watchmen on the wall and prepare the people, but also to go and preach the gospel all around the world. Now, I wanted to touch on several things that I believe are of great interest to many of us uh, today. First of all, you have pro you're probably aware of the fact that um, as the dust settles from the events of the inauguration of the embassy in Jerusalem and the riots in Gaza, you know that eventually truth prevails. And one of the things that the Palestinians did was declaring high number of casualties and not telling the people that most of them, if not all of them, were terrorists, belonged to Hamas. But one of the things that they used during those couple days was a, 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 a young eight-month-old baby claiming that she suffocated from the tear gas that the Israeli army um, uh, uh, used against the protesters and then of course in a very miraculous way they removed her now from the list of the casualties from those events as it was proved to be a hoax she died but she died of complex complications from her heart condition that by the way were known to the Israeli authorities months before in other words we were aware of a baby with this condition before so now knowing that the truth came out, they silently removed her out of the list. And you can see that the entire hot air balloon of, of, of accusations that Israel massacred innocent civilians is now, is now no longer there. When schools and institutions were standing still for a whole minute for the victims of the Gaza massacre, what they didn't know is that they're standing still in memory of armed terrorists. That's what they did. Terrorists that were uh, given instructions to go and kill Jewish people. They were given instructions by emails. They were given instructions by pamphlets. And they did what they were instructed to do. It's very interesting. The leader of the Hamas yesterday in a TV, on a TV interview said that every single day they are closely communicating and coordinating with Tehran. They receive direction from Tehran, they receive funding from Tehran, and they receive instructions from Tehran. Their goal was that on May 14, 1948, all the TV screens around the world will be split. Half will show the opening of the embassy, and the other will show the riots on the, on, on, on the um, fence. We also received indication the day before that Hamas is 
interested in very high number of casualties so this the screen will completely <coughs> excuse me so the screen will not only be split but it will show that here people are getting killed and here people are actually celebrating on the other side and of course that is supposed to show Donald, P President Trump in, in a very negative light so will so is Benjamin Netanyahu the Prime Minister but it didn't really work it didn't work because truth came out and now we know these were all terrorists this little baby was not part of this whole thing they're using cynically babies and children and women to to just create false false reality and that is very sad that so many and I by the way I saw a lot of journalists that said shame on you Israel and two days later retracted that and said I was too too fast to judge Israel in fact I realize now I was wrong and it was not what I was told that it was it, it, it is amazing so we we have to understand that not only that the Palestinians didn't win in this whole thing, but, but actually they have exposed the, the, the face of Hamas, of not only terrorist organization that is using children and women and babies, but also is not coordinated with his people, but with Iran by money and by instructions. And that is exactly what President Donald Trump said. Iran is the greatest destabilizer of, of the whole region, whether it's Hamas whether it's the Houthis in Yemen that are launching rockets almost on a daily basis to Saudi Arabia, whether it's in Iraq and whether it's in Syria and Lebanon, they're using uh, Hezbollah and they're using um, the uh, militias, uh, including their own, um, their own um, Revolutionary Guard units right there. Israel yesterday launch another airstrike in an airbase on the Lebanese Syrian border we this time targeted a Hezbollah manned um, airbase the airbase itself was not used anymore as a military Syrian airbase but it was actually used as a storage facility for air for 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 ground to air rockets that Iran brought over there for Hezbollah to use but also heavy equipment such as armored vehicles, such as Humvees and, and Jeeps and all of that were stored under the ground and they were used by Hezbollah itself. Reports are saying that um, high number of casualties among the Hezbollah was, uh, was shown and the, the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, even said today that um, indeed Israel strike the Hezbollah um, um, center over there in Syria. Israel is determined to remove any threat that might uh, uh, be there on close to our border, whether it's Iranian or whether it's Iranian proxies such as the Hezbollah. Now, we're going to talk for a few seconds about some very interesting things that happened um, over the last few, uh, few uh, days. First of all, you and I know that President Trump announced um, heavy sanctions on Iran or on any company that is going to do business with the Iranian regime. And in a very interesting way, something that your probably media will never tell you, um, major, major companies started canceling all of their contracts with Iran. It started with uh, the, um, the uh, French energy company Total, which were supposed to develop one of the largest oil and gas fields in Iran and then use the oil and gas to, to be sold, continued with um, the um, Danish oil ships company called Torm and container company called Maersk. Both of them canceled their big, big, big contracts. Continued British Petroleum, Boeing and Airbus canceled all of their contracts. The three main French automobile manufacturers who were planning on building um, in Iran factories such as Renault, Citroën and Peugeot canceled their contracts. The Italian energy company Eni canceled its contract. The Polish energy company PGNIG 
cancel its contract and the um, um, financing bank in Germany called DZ Bank is no longer willing to finance some of the loans to the Iranians. This is a loss of hundreds of billions of dollars to the Iranians. If that's not enough, we know that there is a strike of truck drivers in Iran for the last three days. We know that there are protests all across Iran for, for, for quite a number of days right now already. We know that, um, in fact, several um, people hacked the system in the airport of the city of Mashhad and actually on all the screens you could see a, a um, you could see a excuse me on all the screen you could see a a picture with the Arabic inscription that they, in, in Farsi that says um, that they want to remove the tyrant um, regime over there the people of Iran are not interested in the war and they do not like what their regime is doing. That is a fact. And we are watching the Iranian regime being very much pressed by the American sanctions and the European um, uh, uh, run, running away from doing business with them and from within. And I want to add to that the Turkish bankruptcy right now, the Turkish currency lost almost half of its value over the last year and a half. The Turkish Central Bank had an emergency meeting a couple days ago in, in, in Ankara. They don't know what to do and the, the deeper the problem and the, and, 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 and the abyss is over there, the more President Erdogan is inflaming his rhetorics against Israel. For him, I don't want the people to deal with my or their financial problems. I want them to be uh, proud Muslims and hate Israel for what Israel is doing in Jerusalem or to the Palestinians, whatever it is. The usual suspect, Israel. So you see that Russia has lost a lot of billions of dollars right now that will never come to the hands of Iran and Iran will never be able to pay the Russians for any future deals. We see that the Iranian economy is in shambles. We see that the Turkish economy is in shambles. And that all it takes for those three to plot something. You, you probably watched the, the um, interview that Benjamin Netanyahu gave to Judge Janine on Fox News. And I've been saying that for the longest time. The Russians don't really care much about the Syrians or about the Israelis, they care about gas and oil. They thought that by coming to Syria, not only that they can secure their interest on the Mediterranean, but they more so wanted to get a hold of the gas fields and the oil fields of Syria. The United States is now controlling almost everything that has to do with gas and oil in Syria. And therefore, the, the, the Americans uh, on that side, next to um, the Turkish on the north, leaves basically Russia to, co to compete with Iran on what Netanyahu says on the spoils. And, and of course, we, we talked about the fact that eventually when they can get the spoils wherever they want, they'll look for other spoils. And that is exactly the whole purpose of Ezekiel's war. I also said to you so many times that we're not going to see in the, a, a Psalm 83 war. It is no longer about Israel exists or don't exist. It is no longer about the name of Israel will be remembered no more or not. Now it's all about financial gain. And when Rosh and Meshach and Tuval and when, when and all of them will join them, it's about spoils. It's about take the booty takes to plunder, to steal. That's what Ezekiel is basically saying. So we are now in the time where Israel prospers. America, by the way, prospers as well. We are, we're in the time of prosperity that will cause them to come and want to take spoils. Now you understand, that is why it's extremely important that we understand that the time of calm is not less important than the anticipation for the storm because right now during this calm 
you see several amazing things that are happening. The Americans recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Thus, it's no longer the issue, Jerusalem or not Jerusalem. Some people started telling me that they just heard that the future plan of, Do of President Trump of the deal with the Palestinians is going to include dividing Jerusalem. That is not true. President Trump is definitely going to offer something on the table because he has to. He promised the whole world that he will try to bring about a deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis. But remember, the grand deal that he is offering is actually first peace between Israel and the rest of the Arab world, and then, of course, the deal with the Palestinians. Now, he's not going to offer the Palestinians anything even close to what they've been offered so far. If anything, they will only get probably half of the West Bank. If anything, they are not going to talk even about the old city of Jerusalem or any of the surroundings of the old city of Jerusalem anymore. It's no longer on the table. It's no longer going to be... You see, the, 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 the city or township of Abu Dis is not Jerusalem. I, you have to understand, there is already now a wall between Abu Dis and Jerusalem. Abu Dis can and was supposed to be the capital of the Palestinians if they ever had a state already 10, 15 years ago. They are those who didn't want that. And allow me to say in a very calm and very sure manner that once again, you don't have to worry, the Palestinians will miss another opportunity uh, 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 and, and they will again be on the same category that Abba Ibn, our first uh, foreign minister, said, Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Once again, they will reject it. Once again, they will say, no, we're not accepting it. This is, by the way, why the, the Turks and the Iranians will feel that they have the legitimacy to come and join the financial war that, that Russia is going to impose. Russia is going to tell the world, um, you know, or, or is going to come for the sake of the spoils. But Turkey will pretend to come and liberate the Palestinians. And Iran is going to come and, and somehow restore the status of Islam in the region. And that's it. But ladies and gentlemen, the real reason is, of course, the spoils. The real reason is, of course, to take booty. The real reason is, of course, to plunder and steal. And we know that. And... And uh, we see that happening. Beyond that, I also wanted to tell you that Vladimir Putin just said that he's no longer going to be the president of Russia once this, this coming uh, term is over. In other words, he says, by 2024, I will not be the president of Russia anymore. It's very, very interesting because if he is Gog, the prince of Magog, then by 2024, he's basically saying, I'm not going to be in that position of power. So we're having a window, as far as Vladimir Putin is concerned, a window of four, um, six years uh, to do what he wants to do. Very, very interesting. If that's not enough, ladies and gentlemen, the U.S. is now presenting, there is a bill, a defense bill in the U.S. Senate that would bar Turkey from buying the F-35 jets. Interesting, because Turkey was one of the countries that was part of the developers of this jet. And when we see what's going on and how Turkey is close to Iran right now and how Turkey is slamming America and Israel and NATO, it's very, very interesting how Turkey is being held even as as, as an enemy in, uh, by the United States and uh, secrets such as the F-35s should not come to its hands. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say something right now that might sound bombastic, but listen very carefully. I'm not trying to sensationalize anything, but I find it very, very interesting. For the last few years, Israel was invited to take part of NATO drills and exercises. But this is the first time Israel is invited to, um, to take part of, of a, um, an exercise that takes place on the soil of, of Europe. It's no longer naval exercise that we are with them on the sea or air exercise. This is on the soil of Europe. And the Israelis are, are joining 
some other NATO members. And, and when I asked Israeli officials, okay, so what is the real exercise all about? And I was, I was amazed at their answer. You know what they said? The exercise of the Israelis is to stop a Russian invasion. And I asked them, what do, what do you mean? You mean Russian invasion into Europe? They said, you're invited to come to, to see uh, um, how y- you can be part of NATO when it comes to the Russian invasion that we might see coming to Europe. But when you go back home, the Russians are right around the corner for you. That which you learn in Europe, you can al- actually also implement in your own country. I was shocked because the headline in the Israeli website was Israel is bracing for a Russian invasion. I thought they're quoting Ezekiel. I thought they are saying something that, you know, they're maybe taking some scriptures. I was shocked that physically Israel right now is invited to take part of a drill that assimilate a Russian ground invasion and ways to stop it. Very, very interesting thing. Another thing you want to know is that the Turks, if they're not angry enough on, uh, with us, they now warn us not to acknowledge the Armenian Holocaust as a crime of Turkey. That which happened in 1915 and killed so many Armenians by the Turks, which, by the way, you cannot really compare it to to anything else but to a Holocaust. It was a genocide of the Armenians. And the world is so afraid of Turkey that the world is not saying anything. But I want to tell you something. Israel is going to probably join 30 other countries that are already recognizing and acknowledging the Armenian Holocaust. And, and, and that's it. We're no longer, we no longer have to be afraid of maybe we will offend the Turks. The Turks crossed the lines a long time ago. And it's about time that we tell them the truth about what what they did. So that is uh, what happened over there. Um, I want you to also know that um, the um, the drill that we're going to have is called Saber Strike 18. It will be next month, and again, Israel is about to take part in it, and um, I'm just fascinated by it now. That is why I'm saying the calm is important to be before the storm. Because now, during the calm, we get ready, militarily, financially, and I believe even spiritually. If you ask me, the amazing series of great things that happened to Israel right now, starting from the pulling out of the Iran deal, continuing with the moving of Jerusalem's embassy, of the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem, continuing with the very successful um, infiltration into the Iranian secret um, a place that holds their, um, uh, their uh, archive of their, uh, what we knew that happened, secret uh, um, nuclear program, and continue with unbelievable strikes that brought the Iranian presence in Syria two years back. Um, all of those things, and by the way, the ongoing ongoing blind eye that the Russians are turning, um, allowing the Israelis to strike Iranian targets in Syria. All of that, you know, cause, as I said, so many Israelis to think these are messianic times. This is godly intervention. It's something we've never seen before. And uh, as I said, we can maybe prepare militarily for a war. We can maybe prosper now, uh, you know, financially and technologically and all of that. But I believe that what is going on also right now is, is somehow causing the Israelis to almost, almost think that um, messianic times are around the corner. And maybe, maybe we will have peace and prosperity brought to us by a foreign leader which will be held as a Messiah himself. Very, very interesting. I've never heard them saying that before. Um, I also want you to know that for those of you who may still believe that 
the Iranian foreign minister Zarif is a moderate Iranian, um, an Iranian blogger called Hashmat Alavi, who has 30,000 followers, just posted on his um, Twitter account a video. And in that video, you can see that Zarif, um, that looks like a smiling reformist or moderate in Iran, his footage of him chanting death to America and even death to the UK and death to Israel. He was chanting that together with hundreds of other mullahs as they listen to the speech of the Iranian supreme leader um, Khamenei. So that alone can tell you that we're not dealing with honest people. Europe, as you know, is bowing down before the Iranians right now. The Iranians are telling the Europeans, if all the companies are running away, we want compensation. And the Europeans don't know what to do. They banked on the money. All of their economies banked on the Iranian billions that should flow into their pockets. Not only that, a lot of the European negotiators received already money under the table from Iran to bring about the approval of that bill. And Europe is in bed with the enemy. And it's very interesting because, because Europe is so weak, both in, when it comes to the immigration that allows the, the um, radical Islam to um, just bloom. This is something that the Germans walk up to. This is a picture of the main train station of the city of Cologne, Köln. And it's, it has ISIS emblem on it. And it says in, in, German, in Arabic, it says, next one, inshallah. In other words, this is the next, with the help of Allah, this is our next target. And it's a nightmare for the European. You can imagine that. Um, I'm thinking also that... Um, there's a lot of things that are going on right now in Europe that many of you are not aware of. Um, Israel just, on, on our newspaper today, we featured an interesting uh, article. Article that has to do with chip implants. Israel is no longer um, indifferent to that which is going on right now in Europe. Remember, I always told you, Europe is where I believe the Antichrist is going to come from. But let Look what's going on there. I don't know if you know that, but there are companies in Europe that are already implanting chips in the size of a little uh, uh, rice um, uh, um, that um, has in it uh, what we call NFC. It's a near field communication, the same type of communication on your magnetic stripe on your credit card. It has to come in touch with the screen, with the, with the reader, to um, a be activated. In other words, you enter um, into a place, you just, just pass your hand. You, you, you do grocery shopping, you just pass your hand. You go into the train station, you just pass your hand. Um, and there are companies that are popping uh, up every day in Europe. Um, in, in Sweden, thousands of thousands of people are already, already doing that. But what you may not know, what you may not know, is that um, what we have today is um, is um, European cities that are hosting chip parties. They're they're hosting parties where thousands of people are coming, listening to the advantages of the implants the chips that are implanted, and on the spot are having chips implanted in them. It is happening before our very eyes. It's interesting that it's this weekend, all, all over the Israeli media right now. It's, it starts with a man, um, um, a Swedish person called Johan Ostalund, and they said the guy never leaves the house with a wallet because he doesn't need the wallet, and he has a company uh, a company that um, that uh, is uh, actually um, uh, that is called um, biohoax, biohacks. It's, it's like hacking and biology. Literally, we're hacking into the human body, 
in, in implanting in it stuff that they tell you that is not as bad, that is very innocent, that, that um, pacemaker actually has more power over the human body and the health than that chip. That's what they try to sell you. And it's already happening all across Europe. I know that there is a, there is a Minnesota company that, that um, started that, and I know that 50 out of the 70 workers um, had their chips implanted in them. But it's, it's very small in America compared to Europe. In Europe right now, it's the newest thing, and it's just all over. So what do we have right now? We have the calm before the storm. The region is getting ready. Israel prospers. By the way, America prospers. Just so you know, America will have to prosper in order for America to be strong again and to stand by Israel and to allow Jerusalem to be in Israeli control and to, um, and to restore its status in the, in the world. And if you're wondering what may happen to America that will not allow America to help Israel in Ezekiel's war, of course, it's something that we talked about a couple times. Either the rapture is going to take place and the leadership of America is going to be gone and the country will collapse, or a very, very large natural disaster that might cause America to be paralyzed and deal with, with, with lots of other issues. We don't know exactly, but what we know is one thing. God is going to be glorified through this whole thing, even through the war that is about to come upon this world. And so I think that we covered several things that are very, very important. I think that we have to remember that a war with Russia is very, very much on the table, even in Israel. We have to understand that right now, the Russians are our friends because it serves their interest. The Russians are allowing us to operate in Syria because they don't like the competition with the Iranians on the spoils of, of Syria. We understand also that um, uh, both the Russians and the Iranians and the Turks are suffering. They're bleeding financially, and that may cause them to, to be ready more than ever before and come against the most prosperous country in the Middle East. Um, in the emerging power that has the superpower such as America standing behind it and supporting it. Amazing, amazing things are happening right now before our very eyes. It is indeed the calm before the storm. And we're instructed, we're instructed not to fall asleep as others do. So many Christians do not walk in the ways of God. They do not take heed to the sound teaching of the Word of God. As we know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, apostasy has to happen before the Antichrist is coming. Apostasy is happening right now. When churches such as Grace Cathedral in San Francisco are having a whole a whole weekend of, of a Beyonce uh, uh, service, Beyonce songs, and, and, and when they, they are glorifying their um, things that are definitely not biblical, then you see that the church right now is becoming a roof organization to everything but Jesus. And, and it is so sad to see that. It is also sad to see so many Christians that are still unaware of the times and the seasons in which we live. They don't connect the dots. They don't understand that, as Paul, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we're not of the night, we are of the day. We have to be, be sober. And yes, when they say peace and safety, eventually sudden destruction is going to come upon them. But yet, right now, it is peaceful. And it is safe. And it is causing so many Christians to fall asleep. And the warning is, do not fall asleep as others do. So I want to encourage all of you to stay close to the Word of God. To stay close to the, to the promises of God. To hold on. The Bible says, one of my, my most um, 
favorite verses are from the 10th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. The Bible, the Bible says in, 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 in chapter 10 verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the, is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We see that the writer to the Hebrews is telling them, now, more than ever before, as the, the, you see. Now, we are the only generation, by the way, that can see that the day is approaching. I mean, I think that Paul wished, and Peter wished, and, and Timothy, uh, and, and uh, they all wished that they saw what we see. And when people ask me about what is that generation that will not pass, we are the generation. The Bible didn't say generation is 60 or 70 or 80. The Bible doesn't talk about that because that is not the issue here. The issue here is that there is going to be a generation that is going to watch all the events, not only the birth of Israel, but the, the, the coming back of Jerusalem to Israel's hands, the, the um, forming of the alliance in the Middle East to the Ezekiel's war, the apostasy that is happening all around. And all of that, we are the generation that lives to see that. That is why the rapture, I believe, is, is of course imminent, but it is more imminent than ever before. And I believe that in order for that men of sin the Antichrist, to show his face. By the way, people ask me, I believe he's alive. I believe he's somewhere in Europe right now. I believe he's breathing right now. But he cannot show his true face. He cannot step into world stage right now and do what he wants to do before we, the restrainer, those who have the Holy Spirit in them, are first removed. Therefore, I urge you all, be sober and put upon you the armor of God and hold on to the confession of our faith, of that hope, the hope that we're about to see Him very, very soon, that He's about to come and take us. This is our hope. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is that the Lord will come take us. As He promised, I will return and I will receive you unto myself so where I am, you will also be. This is the time for us to be ready. And that is why God gives us a peaceful time. It may not be forever, may not be for too long. Now it's a time for us not to fall asleep as others do, but to actually get ready. And you know, some people say, Amir, what does it mean to work our salvation? I believe that we live in the days of Noah. I believe that people uh, marrying and be given to marriage, people party, people live as there is no, if there is no tomorrow. I believe these are the days of Noah. I believe that the flood is about to come. I believe that we, the people of God, are now, we are supposed to be busy building our ark. The pitch that is covering the ark in the Hebrew is kofar, is, is atonement. The blood of Jesus is what I believe is our atonement. I believe that to work our salvation means to be busy instead of partying in the world, instead of living the good life that the world can offer, we must live holy life and prepare our ark. We don't know the day, but when it comes, it will wash away everything and we will be taken. We will be saved from the wrath of God. That is why I believe that right now, instead of falling asleep, we need to be very, very busy about our Father's business. And so I'm, and, 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 and one thing that bothers me more than anything is that we must understand it is not the messenger, it is the message that we must hold on to. It is not the person who delivers, it's not about me, it's not about other pastors, it's not about other evangelists, it's about the message. And you have to be good Bereans. Nowadays, 
people are, there's so many false prophets and there's so many antichrists. The Bible talks about those who comes from within us. There's so many of them. It's, there is an inflation, especially in, in the days of social media. You have to discern and be good Bereans and look into the scriptures daily and search and see if what people are teaching you is indeed biblical. One of, one of the things that a little bit embarrasses me, and I will be very, very honest with you, is when people see me, and it's, it's, it's a new thing right now, I'm, I'm not used to it. People want to take pictures, people want to have my signature. I am so embarrassed by all of that because it's really not about me, it's about the message. And, you know, I'm almost I'm afraid that these things can, without knowing, become idolatry. Of, of, of admiring someone rather than the Lord Himself and His Word and His message. So I, I just want you to, instead of be fascinated by the speaker, be fascinated by the message. And the message has to always be, what is it that the Bible say and how is it that we see around us? What is it that we see around us that matches the Bible? That's what it's all about. It's not about the people. It's about the doctrine. The doctrine is now under attack, is under heavy assault. And I believe with all of my heart that side by side would, would seeing the calm before the storm and seeing the, the maybe the, the amazing um, prosperity and peace and all of that spiritually, we are in the days of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We see apostasy all over. Spiritually, we're bankrupt. Spiritually, we're probably, the church is in its almost worst shape ever. I mean, it's because we no longer have any excuse. It's not like we're in the Middle Ages where people didn't read the Bible. We have the Bible and we don't read it. We have the Bible and we misquote it. We have the Bible and we, uh, and we choose to, to, to lean on on other things and people forget the very very sacred balance between the Spirit and the Word of God either that they toss away the Word of God and they're all about the Holy Spirit or they toss away the Holy Spirit and they're all about the doctrine and we have to remember that both are equally important in order to understand the Word of God we need to have the Holy Spirit and in order to 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 um, uh, in order to uh, understand the Holy Spirit, we obviously need the Word of God. And these things go together. And I just want you to understand um, that um, nowadays, more than ever before, we just need to stay strong and we need to hold on to the confession of our faith because He who promised indeed is faithful. So why don't we uh, close this with uh, the ironic blessing and all of you uh, hopefully can f share this message with your friends on Facebook. It will be posted in a few hours on, on YouTube. It's right now Shabbat in Israel and my staff in Israel cannot do it right now. It's in the middle of the night, but it will be on YouTube. Please follow us on Facebook, on YouTube. On YouTube, by the way, we're crossing the 100,000 subscribers probably tomorrow. Thank you for following us there. On Facebook, you can follow us. On Instagram, Behold Israel, one word. You can sign up to our newsletter that comes every week as an email. Um, on, and you can sign up uh, via our website, BeholdIsrael.org. So let us pray. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה. יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine His face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance towards you and give you peace. That shalom, that peace that surpasses all understanding that can only come from, by the Prince of Peace the Lord of peace, that can give you peace now and everywhere and at all time. And it is His, in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. I love you. 
God bless you from Leapers Fork, Tennessee. See you in Israel next week. Shalom and God bless you.